in Ghana just got better with the introduction of first digital TV decoders. FDTV offers you over 80 channels of more Ghanaian content, more news, more fun, and strong after sales support. For more inquiries, contact us on All right, you're welcome back. We're on the first show on FNN. Um, and I told you that we we're having an interview, a one on one, with the Deputy Minister for Information. And um, he's also a um, member of parliament as well for Ofwasi Airebi. Now, uh, he's a person of Honorable Kojo Opon Kroma. He's Deputy Minister for Information. And he will give us some. I don't know if I can open the phone lines for you, but I'm sure producers will do as I'm honest and will allow some few questions so that you can also have the opportunity to speak one one with him. So zero five zero one three one eight one five four or zero five zero one three one eight one six two are the numbers. You call any of them when I open the phone lines. You can actually um, come across which your questions. Robert, you're welcome. Good morning. Thank you. How are you? I'm well. How is government and everything? We're pushing. You're pushing. Yeah. Do you feel the pressure more than you expected? No, no. We have uh, made a lot of uh, commitments um, to the people of Ghana, and we have um, outlined a number of things that we desire to do within this four-year period. So it is only fair and expected that people will demand progress report, status report, we want to know what is going on in various areas. And I don't think that we should consider that as pressure at all. It is, it is what we have uh, committed to, what we've taken up, and we need to provide those answers when we are asked about it. Sometimes when opposition comes up with issues and they are trying to demand for answers, you know, you get some government officials who come and say, why won't you just keep quiet and stay in opposition, things like that. Is opposition doing the right thing or they should shut up? I don't think it's a battle between opposition and government. It's a battle between um, the people of Ghana and the challenges and opportunities ahead of us. And uh, at any point in time, when the people of Ghana have um, interests on particular subjects, mm -hmm. it is our job to respond to them. But I think often what you find is that the media will pitch the opposition against, against. government. And if you are not careful, it begins to appear as though it is a battle between you and an opponent on the other side. And that's what degenerates sometimes into some of those conversations. But I think if we keep an eye on the big picture that we are providing a service of public policy, public good to the people of Ghana, and we have to answer the questions that the people of Ghana raise, we will not look at it from the point of view of a battle between opposition and government. Mm, but when they actually, um, for example, minority sit in parliament and hold press conferences, do you find their press conferences legitimate enough that, okay, this is something that I think we have to provide some explanation to? This is how I look at it. I don't look at it from a point of view that we're in a battle with a minority in parliament or with an opposition. There's not a battle between MPP and NDC. It's a battle between the people of Ghana and the challenges and opportunities ahead of us. Now, if the minority does a press conference, they're entitled to an opinion. They're allowed to express an opinion. Their opinion may be right, it may be wrong. Our challenge, our job, is to explain what the facts are, what the truth is, carry the people of Ghana along on where we are going. If somebody chooses to, um, on the sidelines, you know, sometimes throw up allegations about things that don't exist, sometimes mm. cast aspersions or whatever, that's, that's part of democracy. That's part of his right. But I don't think that we should be overly consumed and fixated on an exchange and a battle of what? with somebody who is expressing his right to free expression. No, I think we should focus on the work, carry the people along. Mm. That's what we're voted to do. Right. Right. Now let's turn our attention to the economy. How really does the NDC, uh, MPP intend to turn around the economy for it to be felt by the ordinary person on the ground? That's a very nice way you've put the question because at the end of the day, whatever you do, the question is how does it reflect in my pocket? How does it change my life? There are two levels to it. Um, for those who have 
you know, paid attention to economic management. There's what we call the macro. Mm -hmm. This building, for example, sits on a foundation. Mm -hmm. Without that foundation, you cannot hang lights here and microphones here or even have this building. The foundation is what we call the macro. You first need to fix the foundation. First fix the foundation. Fix the macro. And then you can build specific economic interventions on it that will translate into people's lives. Mm -hmm. Now, building the macro requires that you keep a handle or keep a firm hand on a number of things. Some of the macroeconomic indicators like inflation, like interest rates, um, like your currency, like your reserves, things like your deficit position. Mm. You need to firmly manage all of these things. And you would recall that in the last, um, you know, 24 months, for example, coming to now, <coughs> our macro has not been in the best of positions. Mm -hmm. The first priority of this government to be able to deliver on any of its specific agenda requires it to sort out the foundation. And that's why we have been working very, very strongly on the currency, on our reserve position, on um, inflation, for example, the key macroeconomic indicators, the environment for doing uh, business, the energy situation, etc. It is when you fix People want, for example, jobs in industry. Mm -hmm. Industry will not function if you still have an energy crisis. Mm -hmm. So you've got to tackle those ones first. If the uh, inflationary situation is such that it's skyrocketing and uh, you cannot control prices, uh, people's purchasing power will be eroded. So you've got to fix all of these ones first. So the first priority has been to fix these ones. And you will notice that in the first six months, any objective person looking at the statistics even would notice that the needles are moving in the right direction. How is that? How are you convincing us indeed that needles are I don't need to convince in? you. Look at the numbers on inflation. Look at the numbers on interest rates. Look at the reserves. Look at the currency position. You are you know, um, a very well-respected journalist. You can look at those numbers and report to your people. Is inflation going down or up? Is the currency stabilizing or not? Are our reserves improving or not? Are current accounts and capital accounts improving or not? You can tell that as a matter of fact. And those ones are not debatable. You would even now find that the international partners... But I can argue that the currency is not that stable, as you put it, at least not for now. No, it's been stable. Ask yourself from January to now, what's been the rate of depreciation? And compared to previous years. These are matters of fact. They are not debatable. You can look at it, do a trend, and then tell your viewers what it is. And now, even the international partners that we deal with are acknowledging this and are literally revising some of their ratings. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen the ratings mm -hmm. from Fitch mm -hmm. and other places. So the macro, I'm not saying that we're out of the woods yet or we have solved the problem. No. The macro is beginning to move in the right direction. That's the first step. It is upon this macro that now you can build specific interventions like jobs, okay? Mm -hmm. Like um, growth. Because once you have growth happening in specific sectors of the economy, Growth is followed by jobs. Jobs are followed by incomes. When people have incomes, then now they can contribute more to the national kitty, and then we can continue the cycle a bit more. So if you ask me about the economy, the macro is beginning to stabilize. It's beginning to move in the right direction. I'm sure you've read the latest Monetary Policy Committee report of Quite the yeah. Central Bank, where now clearly uh, you'll find that broad money is increasing, and those reserves as they increase is increasing credit to the private sector. It's not where you want it to be yet, but you can begin to see the needle moving in that particular direction. So early days yet, change has started, the macro is st stabilizing, and now upon it, you can build the specific interventions like the industrialization interventions that we have spoken so strongly about, about getting industries in every district across the country. That is what will create a lot more jobs. Also, as the stability um, is prolonged, and the confidence of the producer, what we call the producer confidence index, mm -hmm. the business confidence uh, becomes more buoyant and you have more investments. It is these investments that create the jobs. We are a party that firmly believes not in central government creating jobs, but in creating what we call the enabling environment. That's the mark I've been talking about. So that is now easier and more exciting for the businessman to put his capital in to create a business which employs people. And when he's well regulated, well protected, he can do a lot more. So. Simply put, macro stabilizing. Now the direct interventions are also uh, beginning. A lot of work, as I'm sure you have followed, is being done, for example, on the one district, one factory. Um, specific sectors of the economy where we want to engineer some growth in the integrated aluminum um, industry, for example, you begin to see some work there. In Agric, which for many years was, uh, uh, may I say, even our lead, you're beginning to see some very significant interventions um, in Agric uh, as well. And as we improve the business environment, services, 
you know, services flourish on the back of an improved uh, business environment. Yeah. As, as we improve the business environment where access to credit is faster, credit is cheaper, then you begin to see services also flourish. Today, services contribute more than 50% of our GDP. Yeah. So there's a correlation uh, between stabilizing the macro and an improvement in services. There's a correlation between the specific interventions and an improvement in agri and an improvement in industry. And finally, you'll notice that um, the latest figures from the um, Ghana Statistical Service tell you that quarter one GDP it's gone up by 6.6% as compared to about 4.4% same period yes. the year before. Yes. So um, this is this is not talk. Now the numbers are beginning to show it. But we are not even we are not even satisfied. We don't think that this is something to be clapping about. No, this is still early days. This is just six months. We have a lot of work to do. But, but you cannot you cannot take all the glory um, if we compare the year after year um, statistics that are showing. It doesn't mean that it's because the MPP has been in government for six months and numbers are already changing. What backs that argument? It, it could be that, well, maybe some structures have been put in place by the previous Such government. As? I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to be specific. You on, can't on, find on. it. And that's why I actually that question. You <laughs> can't find it. But we can clearly tell you, for example, that when we put in place a program for, uh, first of all, when you put in place an economic policy, okay, that clearly shows that you are interested in stimulating private sector growth. That policy itself has a signaling effect. And immediately, you begin to see private sector confidence go up. People who are even contemplating withdrawing investments all of a sudden begin to say, okay, we get a sense that this government wants to work to stimulate private sector. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we'll keep our investments. We'll make some more investments. Now, these things, for example, have a long effect on contributing to productivity because as i've said our paradigm is to ensure that we create an environment that makes it easier for the private sector to have confidence to operate a by signaling even a budget of that kind by introducing some tax cuts releasing some money for the private sector to operate with their productivity is increased and you're beginning to see um, the numbers if somebody wants to claim that it is a spillover of uh, previous months he would need to back his argument with some specific facts but i think that our job is to explain to the people of ghana that these things that we are doing initially may look like just talk or just some numbers but it begins to translate take the energy situation for example it's not perfect yet but I think any observer will say that there's been a significant improvement, improvement in yeah. managing the energy situation. We don't even think we are there yet. Now we think that we have to go for a long-term fix for the energy situation. The energy situation is a product of inefficiency in the energy value chain. Inefficiencies that are costing or that are worth about $2.5 billion. Now we have done, or the previous government introduced what they call the small fix approach. The energy sector levies at which consolidated the various energy sector levies. Mm -hmm. What we are doing now is to say that it's going to take us about 10 years to even clear the current debt with the energy sector levies. If you don't clear the debt, ECG, Grid Co, VRA, some of the producers, they cannot retool. And if they cannot retool, some of the machines that are being stressed now, even though we've managed to do some short fixing that is stabilizing the situation, they'll give up. So you have to find money, okay? to inject into the energy sector as a single bullet so that all of these players can retool and then you get a long-term efficiency. Which is what you're trying to do. Are you, are, are you finding the money? Yes, yeah, so now we've appointed a transaction advisor. They are on the global market. Yesterday I was on an um, investor conference call at the finance ministry with um, investors from all over the world. Um, we're getting into a phase where now the transaction advisors are going to literally pull in the money mm. so that now you can inject into the energy sector and bring the efficiency that you are looking for. Now, initially, when we start talking about uh, the fact that the energy crisis is a financial crisis and we need to inject a single bullet 2.5, it all looks like numbers and just talk. But it is when they begin to translate that you begin to realize that the results are coming. So some of them may look like talk Did you say that it was a financial problem? Because I heard Dr. Endum say loudly, I mean, well, I don't know if it was because I was close to him, but I mean, when you went on debates, he made it very, very clear that it was a financial problem. He also indicated it was going to go beyond even four years to have this problem fixed. The MPP's presidential candidate, the MPP's energy uh, uh, policy team at the time, uh, articulated, uh, and it's loud all, all over you know, networks right now. If you Google it, you'll find it. Articulated that the energy problem was not a technical problem. It was a financial, was a financial problem. problem. And that this is how to fix it. And today, as the people of Ghana bought into our model, we are working uh, along those financial lines to, to fix it. So it's still early days yet. 
but I think the needles are pointing in the right direction. Mm. The the I think the buoyancy of the business environment confidence was felt even during the campaign period when you kept hammering on private sector, private sector en engagement and private sector en engagement. But taxation, of course, hasn't been so friendly to the business environment. And they always want to question ah, why these, what you call nuisance taxes. So you took some away. Yes, yeah, so and then 16 we different um, tax handles. A tax handles. 16, 16 different. 16 in one budget. That's significant. Look through our previous budgets. When was the last time you saw a government in one budget cycle take away 16 tax handles? It's huge. And at the time, you remember the, the, the argument was that we we're going to put the country in fiscal jeopardy mm -hmm. and that we'll not be able to raise the revenues that are um, required. And we have made an alternate argument that looking at the model we are operating, we have the view that yes, initially we will suffer a jolt, but over the medium to long term, we will rake in a lot more. Uh, and people will be more compliant because it is easier um, to pay with some of the lowered thresholds. The important thing is that this is what is translated into the further buoyancy um, in the business community as they begin to realize that, okay, um, yes, it may not be all done yet. And indeed, these are not all the tax reliefs that we promised. I think this is just about yes, half yes, of the tax reliefs yes. that we promised, or, or a little under half, about 40, 40, 40, 43, 44 percent of the tax reliefs that we promised. Of course, you can't do all of them in the first budget cycle. We've got a four-year mandate. We are expecting that as we go along and as things begin to settle, we can even bring more relief um, to the private sector. So are you saying that, for example, the 3% um, new one that has been introduced... It's it, not a new one. It, 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 well, I, okay, I won't call it a new one. But is it... Okay, so I'm, I've spoken with bankers who think that the government is not coming clear with taxation. So you may want to do some explanation to it. What is the difference between the 16 handles we've taken off and the, I don't know, what, how will you term it? If they are no new ones, what will you call them? So this 3%. So first of all, the about 16 other tax handles which we have abolished are the ones we called nuisance taxes. But we also promised that we were going to replace the 17.5% VAT input output. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the times people don't describe the thing well. And it leads to part of the confusion. People say 17.5 and 3%. No, you've, you've got to describe it properly. It's a 17.5% input output VAT, which is an approach for calculating value added tax. And it comes with its own complications. Mm -hmm. what, what we've said is that, A, to simplify the approach, and B, to improve compliance, we're going to scrap that and replace it with a 3% flat rate. So the 3% flat rate is not a new addition. I'm sure you've noticed that some people initially were saying that, oh, 17 plus 3 makes 20. So then prices are going to go up. No, we are taking away the 17.5% input-output and we are replacing with 3%. And if you just let me explain. So the chain is shortened, sort of, or the chain is just made one time. The, 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 the model of calculation. Sure. As for the value added chain, it will remain. There will be manufacturers, wholesalers, sometimes there are even three levels in the wholesaler category before okay. you get to retailers, sometimes even two in the retail. Yeah. The chain will remain. But the approach for calculating VAT mm -hmm. initially, VAT is 15% plus 2.5% NHIL. 17.5. The approach was that you would do a 17.5% input tax, which you will pay yeah. to whoever you bought the goods from. And then when you add your value and you are selling, you will do another 17.5% output tax. And then whoever is buying from you will pay. Now you will net off the input from the output. The net is the real effective margin that you are paying to government. Mm -hmm. You see how confusing mm -hmm. the calculation mm -hmm. is, even mm -hmm. as I'm talking to you about it. <laughs> and because of this, a lot of retailers were evading mm. VAT. I'm sure or I hope you've been to places where you're buying something and then they ask you that, Madam, uh, open VAT invoice and I own pay VAT invoice. Because it's difficult going through all yeah. of these computations. Yeah. Yeah. Now the moment they say that, what they mean is that, Madam, do you want us to conspire to evade VAT or not? That's the real question they've asked you. Oh. And they say, oh, I don't want VAT invoice. You, you just give me a normal receipt. You have conspired to evade mm, VAT. And, and quietly. And we are losing a lot of revenue. Because we are losing a lot of revenue, government has to compensate. So what the former government was doing was that these losses 
are not being tackled, then the increased taxes on other handles, these mm -hmm. taxes which we call nuisance taxes. Mm -hmm. Our argument is that no, make it simpler and easier for people to comply so that you can lower the tax handles. You can reduce it. And based on the Laffa effect, we know and that when you lower evasion. it, yes, when you lower it, you eliminate evasion. It's now it's easier for everybody to pay something small. If you sell 100 CDs for the month, you pay three CDs. Everybody pays something small, we get along. Barry do tried it, it worked. We got a lot of revenue intake to do a lot of social goods. Um, uh, uh, NHIL at that time was so well funded that now maternal health care was being paid for. When you have a baby and you're going home, you're even giving Sarah Lack and things to go because revenue had gone up. Now that these inefficiencies are occasioned, you are forced to increase that handle. So it's a combined approach. Lower the handles, but bring about efficiency. Broaden the base so that more people can pay. And now with this 3% flat rate, all that we are saying is that don't worry about 17.5% input output calculation and filing of returns. When you sell at the end of the month, whatever you sold, 3% pay to government. Simple. And now everybody is able to pay. You don't need to do all of these calculations. Initially, yes, there's difficulty in explaining and getting people along. I mean, look at VAT in 1995. Mm -hmm. People died, literally, uh, before it came back around 98. So we expect that there will be some pushback and difficulty. But our job, our challenge, is to carry the people along, like I mentioned at the beginning of our interview, explain to the people. And once those views settle, we will be able to uh, move forward. And we're also open to feedback and criticism. Give us feedback, give us criticism, if we have to tweak things to make it easier for people to comply. But have this you been proactive enough to um, at least monitor the implementation of some of these macro um, policies to ensure that is it being friendly, business friendly, as you wish or as you promised it was going to be? Because what you, you were ex expected to be was not to you know, directly go and try to invite businesses, but to just have businesses come on, on board automatically. So let me give you one example. Take our debt position. Debt to GDP ratio, uh, as at the time we finished the transition, was about, I think, about 73-74% of GDP. During the budget, for example, you had people doing a debate that, no, it's 72, it's 73, 74. It's still above 60, mm -hmm. which is not healthy. 74% mm -hmm. debt to GDP ratio. And every year, we were spending huge sums of money on debt servicing. So this government said, one of the macro policies, and I'll show you how it's translating, one of the macro policies is to reprofile our debt. If a lot of our debt is, um, let's say, five-year instruments, so you owe, <coughs> you owe uh, 12,000 CDs, just an example, you owe 12,000 CDs for one year, you have to pay a thousand cities every month to pay off. Your salary is thousand five. When you pay the thousand, you are left with five hundred. No fiscal space to do anything for your kids' school fees, health, etc. So you can reprofile that same twelve thousand cities by getting a new lender who says, "I'll give you the same twelve thousand cities, but I'll give it to you for two years." All of a sudden, the same twelve thousand now you're only required to pay five hundred cities a month. Your salary at thousand five. Now you've created fiscal space of an extra thousand which you can now use to invest in other things. Mm -hmm. That's the whole concept of reprofiling our debt. Mm -hmm. We reprofiled the debt. What it did was mm -hmm. I, uh, it immediately added to our uh, forex reserves because a lot of people who came to buy bought with dollar. Mm -hmm. So it added to our um, uh, forex reserves. It eased pressure on our books. So now government no longer needed to service so much money on a monthly basis. It gave us fiscal space, which we are using now to pay a lot of the old outstanding debt. You've heard mm -hmm. that we've paid one at least one quarter of the District Assembly's Common Fund. Mm -hmm. We've paid health insurance. <coughs> it's because we have now created a bit more fiscal space. The consequence is that as government is no longer borrowing a lot on the short-term end of the investment curve, the rates are dropping. Today, Treasury bill rates are about, what, 13% there about? I haven't checked the latest on Treasury they bills. They have come down significantly. Come down. Uh, yeah. Because Treasury bills are when government goes to the short end of the market yes. and says, I'm broke, I need money, give me some money, I promise you I'll pay you 16 15%. The more money government needs, the more rates government promises. Now, when government reprofiles the debt and goes to the long end curve and leaves the short end, you've noticed rates falling. As rates are falling, the effect is that the, the, the residual money in the banks, or what we call broad money in economic terms, the bank manager has to ask himself, what can I do with this money to make profit on it so that I can pay light bill, water bill, pay salaries? And the bank manager says, well, it's not prudent anymore just to be sitting in the bank and buying treasury bills 
with depositors' funds. Okay? So rather, let me make that money available to private sector borrowers who can borrow the money and do some business, make some profit and pay me back. And the statistics from Bank of Ghana are beginning to tell you that supply of credit to the private sector as a result of an increase in broad money, as a result of reprofiling, supply of credit to the private sector is beginning to increase. Quarter one, quarter I, I think the last one around, um, I think April, which they issued, supply of credit to the private sector is beginning to increase. As we do more of this, and, you, and your question is, are we beginning to see any tangibles? Yes. So reprofiling of the debt has led to a certain easing of the, um, the markets on the short end. As supply of money is increasing, the banks are beginning to put the money in private sector credit. As banks make more money available in private sector uh, credit, as we bail out some of the uh, industrial enterprises that have struggled, as we roll out the National Entrepreneurial Innovation Program that makes more money and technical advice available to young business people, that's where growth comes from. Growth is what brings jobs. Jobs are what brings income. That's the value chain, and it's beginning to show. Um, I, I, it's interesting. I've been watching you on other platforms, and every time you speak, it's like I want uh, too many questions pop up in my head. Um, because the economy really is the base of where to start everything from. True. So I try to, you know, get all the questions around the economy because we can fly from there yeah. as a country. I will open the phone lines in a few minutes. So you, you just allow me and um, let me just get some more answers still on the economy. And then you can be allowed to ask some questions if you wish. Um, I wanted to ask a question on still taxation. Do we still see taxation as the source of revenue for government or do we have any other alternative? So government's revenue sources are divided into two broad categories. We have tax revenue, okay. um, which contributes about 60, I think the last one I checked, about 64% average of total government revenue. So there's tax revenue. And then there's non-tax revenue. Non-tax revenue is made up of grants. It's made up of um, dividends that come in uh, from some of the assets that government <coughs> owns. And it's made up uh, from part of IGF that hits the government chest. You okay. do know that now we've capped some of the funds. Yes. Not everybody's happy with it. Some want you know, the capping limits to be reduced. That's fair. That's what happens in an economy. We negotiate mm -hmm. between government and the people. Mm -hmm. But you know, a country is supposed to depend a lot on its own resources. And economic policy tells us that we want governments over the years to figure out how to raise a lot more tax revenue to meet the needs of the people. Today, we are not able to recruit I mean, currently, if you look at our police to citizen ratio, okay, it's a huge gap. Mm -hmm. The UN has um, a standard. We are like 50% behind what the UN standard mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Why? But, but recently, you allowed the police to recruit more to mm -hmm. at least bridge the gap a bit. We have, we have told them that we are making provisions so that they can recruit about 8,000. yes. Which has never happened. 8,000 police officers in one year. Check the numbers. It has never happened. Okay, why? because we are finding money for it. Why haven't we been able to do it over the years? You, you hear of a lot of crime. Police were complaining recently that they can't buy fuel. Police vehicles broken down all over the place. Mm -hmm. Police ammunition, questionable. The president can even issue instructions that, listen, deal with people even if they are my party members. But if the policeman doesn't have the logistics to go out there to deal with it, it just becomes yeah, an equally, edict. Mm -hmm. So you've got to back it with money. How do we back it with money? We need to raise more revenue as a country mostly through the tax system because you can't rely on aid you you notice that the finance minister the president have been talking about ghana beyond aid yeah ghana beyond aid yeah we have to get to that point where ghana is self-sustainable ghana working where we don't have to depend on aid that means that we have to grow the tax revenue basket now do we grow the tax revenue basket by asking the same taxpayer to pay more or by bringing in more people who are making a lot of incomes but are not paying taxes that is why you've seen us go heavily on three things, the formalization of the economy. And we say that we are going to do the national ID. Yeah, we which is, do I don't know if my article came to your notice, because I said uh, in an article when uh, the president assumed office first that uh, he was going to fail if he doesn't ensure that um, he implements the national ID. I was in the room when the president told the National Identification Authority team that I want this done by September. Oh, okay. So he's committed to it, he's pushing them on it, I mean, we just returned from a cabinet retreat in Pediasi mm -hmm. where he kept hitting on it that I want this thing done by September. But just to end my point, if you do the national ID, the person has a traceable national ID, 
biometric. Yeah. So you can find him wherever. And it's linked to a digital addressing system. So that even if he moves addresses, we can still so find him. And it is linked to an interoperable platform. Today, mobile phone penetration is about 140%. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody has a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. If we can identify you by your biometric data and your phone and your digital address, you have literally formalized the economy. A lot of people who are evading taxes, we can now very easily find them. And if everybody is paying his share, we don't need to burden you. We don't need to take up your tax. We have promised in the, uh, uh, in the manifesto that we want to bring corporate taxes down from 25% to 20%. Yeah. You notice that in the Kufo era, we brought it down from 32% to 25%. 25. Yeah. Why? Because we were able to lift general revenues so we could ease the tax handles or the tax threshold. Yeah, th threshold. Sure. We are saying in this era as well that if we are able to, today we've been able to only reduce about 16 of the tax handles. If we are able to successfully implement national ID, digital addressing system, interoperability, and formalize the economy, it's easier to track. And now we're able to rake in more. We can even bring down, as we promised, the corporate rate from 25 to 20. But these things are done systemically, else there'll be a shock in the economy and we'll find ourselves. But what we can do today, we have done and we are moving uh, on to do the rest. Um, the just a little question on the police recruitment. 8,000. Are you checking for fraud? Possible fraud? The police administration over the years has been working to tighten its systems. Um, it is our expectation that as they go through the system, today you notice that the first line of engagement is not even direct. It's more automated. You buy a scratch card, like other militaries, you buy a scratch card, nobody knows you. Buy a scratch card, filling the year uh, and your grade. It's an algorithm. That's what will pick you first to eliminate all the potentials for fraud. Um, you are allowing less human interaction, more automaticity. Once that is done, and now it's left with checking height and medicals, etc., you expect that the tendency for fraud is coming down. I know the new IGP and his team are working to uh, improve some of these things. We expect that they will do so uh, for it to be successful by the time they roll it out. Okay, we're in the studio with um, Honorable Kojo Oponkoma. He's Member of Parliament for um, Ofwasia Yerebi. And in fact, when I was pitching for the M M PPP to win, because I was seeing signs. Could you open Kuma surprise the PPP? Oh, <laughs> the <good> PPP. <laughs> so I went to sleep. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you for doing that to the PPP. You, you. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you. I always wanted to get the opportunity to ask you how you did the magic because PPP was showing signs that it was taking mm. the seat in, uh, you know, fancy really? But somehow I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it turned around. Oh well. yeah. It's called politics. It's called politics. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll, we'll learn about that later. <laughs> so uh, we're discussing issues of the economy and uh, we've searched on issues on uh, you know vats and maybe maybe the economy in general on loans i don't want to go into details because there are some at least the latest one that came was um the um, relationship you were able to create with the chinese which we tried getting some information from you um in fact your office and several times and even in parliament several times were turned down um no one seemed to want to, to speak on the matter uh, it was as though it was only within the vice president's per permit or purview to touch on it why was that so i don't know exactly why that impression was created came across but you you it came to you it came to your notice I that we do didn't not recall uh, okay. i do not recall okay. i mean on a daily basis I, I i do several interviews speak to several platforms explaining government policy particularly government um, economic policy um if i'm available at the time I'll be able to. So today I'm sitting here with you for like an hour. Okay. I'm sure my phones are ringing mm. um, like crazy. It can wait. And aha. Uh -huh. So <laughs> some other station in Sunyai will well, probably call and yeah. then they'll say it came to your attention, but nobody was willing was, to talk. Okay. But it's because I was with you talking okay. to you about something okay. else. So you'd forgive us on that. All one. right. But um, yes, we are trying again to move Ghana beyond aid. Ghana beyond aid means that not focusing so much on, you know, handouts but doing more partnerships and trading with the global business community. So what we have done with the Chinese is essentially to have a conversation that says that we would like to partner with you to achieve a number of objectives, a number of objectives. Two first things, well, two things. We are rolling out a one district, one factory program, an industrialization program. We would like a facility, a $2 billion facility mm -hmm which can assist the one district, one factory concept. That facility is a facility between um, 
a Chinese conglomerate, and a number of selected banks in Ghana working with the Association of Ghana Industries. Mm -hmm. So that MOU was actually signed by Mr. Tony Otin Jesse mm -hmm. and the Chinese partners. It's not a government um, loan. loan. Government has only facilitated the framework agreement. For private sector For private too. sector. So these Chinese enterprises are going to work through the banks to assist local entrepreneurs who want to go into the one district, one factory concept. That's a, that's about two billion. You have another one billion. First, we talked about 500 million. Later, the Chinese were willing to explore another 500, making it a billion. Between the Exim Bank of China and the Exim Bank of Ghana, also for one district, one factory, that brings us to about 13. Mm -hmm. Um, 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 that's two plus one, that's three. Three. You have another 10 billion joint venture mm -hmm. agreement for the um, integrated aluminium industry that we want to set up. It comprises a mine, that's a bauxite mine in the Ninehini enclave. Mm -hmm. It comprises a refinery. It comprises a power plant because if we're going to do an integrated aluminium project, you need cheap power. You need power of about two to three cents per kilowatt hour to burn all of that um, bauxite into alumina, either for export or for Valco to use. So you need cheap power. So it, so it has an inbuilt um, um, gas, power, um, gas power plant. You have railway connections that can move the bauxite to and from the mine mm. because we don't want all of that bauxite on our roads. It's going to destroy our roads. When you put all of these things together, it's about $10 billion. A. Should we go and borrow 10 billion and add to our debt stock, which is already around 74% as at end of year last year? Beyond the threshold. No, we don't want to do that. So how do you have a conversation with the Chinese that says that? I have assets of about 460 billion sitting under the ground. I need 10 billion to set up a factory and a mine and railway on top of it so that we can extract the 460 billion and create jobs and incomes for our mutual benefit. Can we get into a joint venture where I bring my 460 and you bring your 10 and then we leverage my 460 which i have that's my contribution to this joint venture and you bring the 10 the chinese say well we hadn't thought of that but it sounds like a fantastic idea that's why you call it leveraging that's why we call it leveraging our assets so not borrowing not putting up our asset as collateral but bringing our asset to the table and saying that we have a 460 billion dollar asset under the ground we need 10 billion there so that we can extract and make value from it. Even if you net off, uh -huh. you are talking about 450 billion still on our side. Let's say my maths is not good. Worst case scenario, 400 billion still on our side. That's leveraging. That's 10 billion. 10 plus 2 plus 1, that's 13 billion. Okay. You have a viewer watching in Fanchinico, does not understand leveraging, does not understand we're going for loans. Use a local, just, uh, you know, create a story around it. Forget the, the minerals or create a story around it and let this person understand what you're Because the argument of what is the difference between leveraging and loans and facility, whatever. But that's what means. I've just explained to you. I, you have explained to me. Yeah. But I want the viewer to understand from your own language. Oh, no, from in the language they will understand what you mean by what. Because the, the perception out there is you are, you're using our minerals, you know, as collateral. Indeed, even the previous government officials have also come out showing certain documents but certain documents certain documents leaked indicating that well this is what the chinese wanted and we didn't want to give them so we opted out and they didn't give us on the global the whole financial markets people will negotiate with you based on the strength you bring to the table you know that if i mean and even here in ghana if you're looking for a job if you're looking for a job and you have built your capacity, you have the right credentials and the right quality. When you go and they say they'll pay you 300 cities a month, you will leverage your qualifications and your strength, your position of strength, and negotiate better. So if you put people at the negotiating table, and with the greatest of respect, they are not able to negotiate well, you don't blame the next person who has been able to negotiate well, well. that, you know, then it's not true, it's not true, there's something wrong. No, we have explained to you that we have $460 billion worth of bauxite sitting under the Ninehini enclave. We need $10 billion to create a factory and its ancillary services so that we can extract that $460 billion. And even if you net, so that we can get the value of $450 billion from it. We don't have $10 billion. We don't have the cash $10 billion. We don't want to borrow 10 billion. So we have gone to tell the Chinese man that come and let us set up a company together. 
where my value in the company is this 460 billion your value is the 10 billion when we extract we will share in proportion when we extract we may decide that i'll use the first is it two years three years to pay you off your 10 billion plus interest which you invested and the rest is mine that is what you mean when you say that you are leveraging the asset collateral is when you say give me 10 billion and come for my but I'll use this I but I use this as security. Yeah, you could see how that's collateral. That's very these are very different finance concepts. And uh, I think our challenge or our job. And that's why I said that this is not a debate between us and the NDC. No, no, I mean oh, don't even mention the party. Yes, it is, you can say government. No, that, so, that's so so it is for us to explain to the people of Ghana that no, this is what we mean. And it's okay if somebody doesn't understand and wants some further explanation. We have to provide that explanation and not get angry or arrogant or I mean, anything about that's a job that we've been given so okay so i i think what I, i'll take my takeaway is just when negotiate you need to negotiate shut up <laughs> <laughs> so oh yeah okay so um I, we we spoke with people on the street and we want to give them the opportunity or want to listen to what people also have to say or what they want to know from government so we'll, we'll pick it up but the numbers also to call 0501318154 or 0501318162 an explanation before the voice pop comes um the fact that the one district one factory is for private sector to take advantage of government didn't say i'm coming to build factories for you government committed itself to creating a framework to facilitating a framework within which it becomes easier for the private sector to lead the uh, establishment of factories in all our districts. What government has done is to identify the investment potential, is to remove or, or is to work towards removing the bottlenecks that make it difficult for uh, the private sector to go out there and to set up um, businesses and to facilitate the process. So for example, I'm telling you about this um, two billion um, uh, facility that government is structuring between the Chinese and it's, it's, it's a lot of technical support a lot of equipment worth about two billion and the banks are going to underwrite that so that the local investor the local private sector can tap into it that is what government has committed to do but as to who would literally take up the factories set them up own it that's private sector because as a party we do not believe that it is a business of government to be owning and building factories it's a business yes. of government to create an environment to stimulate the environment so the private sector can do it. so if we bring taxes down if we put the roads there to these potential factories if we make energy available to these factories and if we get you a supplier who's putting machines and most importantly a market for the product i'll give you one quick example there are places where um, there are places in China where they want industrial starch for their factories. Mm. They say we have the machine, we don't have the first, you know, the conditions to grow cassava and process into starch. So we are willing to make machines available through this two billion facility to a district out there that is willing to just grow cassava, process with the factory, and we'll give you an off-taker agreement that will buy it all. Our job first is to find these 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 investors to create this environment, to get local investors interested and excited we bring taxes down we get the roads that we get the energy there we say tap into the facility pick the machines and get your people to grow cassava on an outgrower scheme so that they can supply the factories and then you know export the starch to china or to the global market that's what we'll do and the private sector man now plays his part and makes the profit and pays the taxes uh, on it the 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 the, the contract no the three billion facility we were getting from the previous government mm -hmm. uh, we took only one billion yes. are, are you uh, resurrecting the two we billion? have had a chat with the chinese about the two billion outstanding and the reason for which um they withheld the two billion outstanding is that the previous government collateralized oil to pay for it now collateral comes in yes they collateralized oil to pay for it and oil prices fell and if they had collateralized <coughs> let's say one ton per year Oil prices are falling, so one ton no longer represents the same amount of money. money. And so the Chinese said, well, then we want more oil because this is a collateral agreement. And they said, no, we can't give you more oil. And the Chinese said, well, then we're not going to release the other two billion. Meanwhile, in the master facility arrangement that they signed... That's what I'm going to ask, the clauses. They pay, or Ghana pays for the full amount that has not even been drawn down. I get it. Such a, I mean, it's, it's an interesting arrangement. Let me call it um, that way. What we have done is we have a chat with the Chinese that says, I release the two billion that is outstanding, but we don't want to go collateral. 
we're not going to up collateral for it and say that if we can't up collateral, then we don't have any other answers. We're going to tie it into the final agreement on the um, integrated aluminium project because mind you that that entire facility was also for energy infrastructure part of the energy which will also be using for uh, the integrated aluminium project so can we tie that in and that is why we said 15 billion because you notice that the earlier um, calculation I did was 10 plus 2 plus 1 which was 13 if you tie in this 2 that is what takes it up to 15 rolled on the back of the integrated aluminium road on the leveraging of the integrated aluminium industry. And then we can front load these funds to finish the projects, uh, that will, but we'll count that as part of the leveraging that we are doing on the integrated aluminium without necessarily collateralizing. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, but producers are looking at time and they don't want to allow you to call in because you people, I know you, they, they open the phone like you hijack it. But let's go for what people on the street also had to say to the information ministry. Oh, I been to Obemi. Galam say no one stop. No, I am dead. I say like Galam say no one move forward. Say, na a pono sa was light no one. No so so stop. Oh, light na. In kanu so yam pa no ban na yeto na man. Obaya hi de kapale. Light na wado kapu no ma. Inam na wapu mu fa domwa. Onya da. Ida entite sibia wo. It is so bottom one, my pun, a light in a water cup from a phone car in Koyeme. Yet, so that was it. What cut a scroll was a light about cop woman, one more petrol. The masterman, your supporter, pa, that was a light in a cop was a one more petrol. Yemi Fabi, now my yet on. Yan top a banner light of worker for ban. Yet on often, num papa, grouper. Uh, cassava fish, red fish, yato. Them light na man em ni na kwechi na lobsters. Wa man em ni na kwechi. Say say wa kwa wenya. Nye mi so petrol na ne ya boka. Nti ma bali yen. Obe is the wa ye ni na. Nye mi wa jumu papa apa ofa ni em fancy line. Nye mi wa jumu papa apa. Nti onko da ye ya tanechi. See now there is calmness in the in the country. Even though the economy is not all that as we want, but you could see that everybody is somehow happy. And then I wish what is on my heart, me. And then that I think every Ghanaian would like him to do is about the special prosecutor. I, I wish if he would be able to uh, implement that thing uh, as soon as, as possible. It will help us. This government, actually, I didn't see anything that we have done that. Oh, actually, for me, my work side worried me a lot. Because the police people, like what if they catch us, they will say one million. This job too. There is still only this one. We don't get anything inside, you see. So we just plead them. Just, just, even if they will do something that, if it is monthly, we we'll pay or uh, 20 Ghana or 10 cities. One among five, Gam say no. As far as our rivers and streams are concerned, Gas Gam say no. They may use a number of money to find on a into a money she make na. A bit is a sick as a mo. So as as it is, I mean, okay. So some say they say they in the dollar and essential too. They say we do port to port. I am very 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 hard. And they say, ni if you send ko mu yi 17.5 percent of us ni fi or nenge nu mumbe affect importation levy. Moreover, some can say we 17 percent every importation levy. So, but right now we do port to a fire in the end. And your ma I extra extra high. And you know, one the port on Shahoye and my na affairs, you know, Gam say no more to one or money, the almost ancient Mokina, no more for policies, sir, or maybe Google or Kremua, a Bema, or here near a woman, you know, I bet.
Okay, before the honorable response to some of the issues that have been said on, on the screen, I have a lot on Facebook and others. WhatsApp says, Annie, let's go up on Kuma, um, answer questions and stop, do uh, you should stop dodging them. You should remember that he was asking the politician same and thinking it was easy. Hmm. Now you should stop being political and talk like a journalist. <laughs> um, MPP men will never be reliable to be and or be trusted. From Mukta, the street journalist in Tamale. Thank you, Mukta. Ani, um, you never ask of me when you you don't hear when you don't hear from me on, my, on your program. Always appreciate your regular contributors uh, because. Um, you're good anyway. I like your program a lot and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. I can't, uh, there are lots I can't ask everything. This one says from the minister, he said they will pay the Chinese 10 billion another interest after the extraction, and still, this is not a loan. Why paying back 10 billion and also paying interest? Then you didn't understand the explanation. What is the interest rate from? Um, Achim Des of Wesco. I, I don't know where Wesco is, but I, I'm sure the Honorable would make time with us again. How about your service? You let me know. I'll be here. Hey, Pacho. Mr. Over, over, my castle, oh, maybe. All right, so. Yeah, so um, I think we should respond to some of the Yeah, but I'm issues. sure I've provided answers to, I think, all the questions that you have asked um, this morning. Maybe about food. Um, we are grateful for the feedback on Galamse and fishing and calmness. Um, it's, it's, it's exciting to know that there are people in this country who want us to do more to fight corruption. I heard one of the persons you spoke to talking about the fact that they are looking forward to the uh, Office yeah, of the in, Independent, uh, independent prosecutor. prosecutor. I've seen the draft bill. Um, just a few comments have been made on it. We're trying to fight tune it, uh, engage on it. It will come to Parliament. We'll discuss it broadly. I'm sure all of you have an opportunity to okay. join. Give us. I just wanted you to give me, you know, some tip off in that. Is the president going to appoint the independent prosecutor? Don't worry. The draft bill will come out, and then um, you will see. Because you see, the thing in fo uh, policy formulation, and sometimes this is what happens, and then we say government is confused because maybe one minister expresses his personal view before okay. then final government view Comes is formed out. and then another express a different view uh, but we're still in the you know finalizing stages so let's finish and then let's um bring it out i want to speak briefly to the ports yes i think that things are tougher in the ports now but things are tougher because of um a number of things some loopholes have been plucked and previously um opportunity so for example if all you had to pay was let's say one million at the port yeah. remember i told you that when there are inefficiencies government compensates by increasing the rates. So the rates have been increased to let's say about 1 million. Too high. So you find that in a simple term, people pay let's say about 600. And then pay some boys about another 100. So total 700. 700 is cheaper than the 1 million they should have paid. paid. And then they've cleared their things and they've gone. When you come in and you say I'm fighting corruption, I've interdicted some officers who are allowing us to lose revenue. And I've closed the loophole. Mm -hmm. Now everybody at the port starts complying. So people start paying 1 million. And they say one million is more expensive than the 600 that I was paying or 700 that I was paying, which is true. But you have to do that first before now we can identify that the one million is high. And so now that everybody is paying. Okay. Let's bring it now. Yes. So it's a bit tough. There's a whole port efficiency project that is going on, trying to move us to pay palace to remove the customs points across the country. There are about 13 different points where points you have to which go and you clear reducing. your goods. Why can't 13 people rather go and check the container at the same time? So that we save time, then you don't have to be paying little, little, you know, inefficient tips all over the place. But you can pay the real amount. Make it paperless. You pay to the machine, come for your container, comes down for everybody to pay. So we are going through a process. Um, you know, when you are <coughs> ill, usually, as you start taking medication, it gets a bit tougher before it gets better. That's where we are. It's going to okay. get a bit tougher as we tighten some of these things and then we're able to lower some of the threshold. And I'll ask uh, your viewers and Ghanaians to bear with us. So the president puts his job on the line on the issue of Galamse. Yes. That's Why? how committed he is to it. Because you would recall that when he said that um, irresponsible mining, which is what we call Galamse, because there are some large-scale mines that do irresponsible mining. Our fight is not about whether or not people should mine. No. And that's why the president has consistently said that from the last 100 years plus, mining has been going on in Ghana. Mining is a major source of revenue to individuals, to companies, to the country. We are not against mining. 
we're against irresponsible mining. People call it galamse. But we're against irresponsible mining. And what we are saying is this. We will stop irresponsible mining. We are committed to it. The president says that if we cannot do anything to leave for the generations on board, we should not destroy the water bodies and the land that at least we inherited. If those ahead of us had destroyed it, where would we be? What would we drink? But you realize how dangerous, how deadly the fight itself could be. You, you realize it? It is dangerous. Th that's th what it is deadly. Yes. But we have to do it. We cannot shy away from it. This is the reason for which I took a Bible in Parliament and I swore an oath to uphold the laws of this country, to uphold the values of this country, to preserve and to protect. The President took a Bible and swore. The Vice President took a Quran and swore. We have sworn an oath by God that we will do these difficult things. Somebody says that if you are committed to, uh, to stopping me from perpetrating irresponsible mining, then I'll make sure you lose your presidency. And the president says, no problem. If I have life and I have health, I will do this. And if you want to vote against me because I'm protecting water bodies, I'm preventing 22 people from dying, like just died in... Um, uh, Pristia the Honey Valley the last week. If I'm doing that and because of that you will not vote for me, then it is something that I can live with. And I think that it's a bold commitment. We need leaders who will say that I'm not looking. And you remember the president, when he was a candidate, said that we don't need leaders who are thinking about the next election. We need leaders who are thinking about the next generation. That's the leadership that the president is showing. And I think we should commend him and support him for that. I'm happy to see that there are some of your viewers who think that it's a good thing and that who think that we should go out there. We're not going to fight and beat people up. We are going to protect water bodies, stop irresponsible mining along water bodies, irresponsible mining by people who have not gotten the right license or people who have the license but are not operating in the manner in which they're operating. And then most importantly, we are bringing in place what we call the multilateral mining scheme, mm -hmm. which will help to regulate, regularize small-scale mining so that people who want to legitimately do small-scale mining can do it but they can do it in the regulated space according to the standards that are set for them. So we're not against mining. We're against the irresponsibilities of mining that is destroying water bodies, killing people. And uh, the oath that we have sworn is one that the president says he will live by even to the peril of his presidency. Our time is up, but a quick one. I know I have a lot of Galamse viewers, so you at least you get the explanation from the man. Now, John Hobson said he had problems with the site. He had problems with the size of governments in the past. Now he has uh, a member of the largest government. Any changing in his opinion on the size of governments? As you said, he is smart. The smart kakrama Okay. Um, I said to you earlier that governance is a conversation between the government and the people. We come up with policies and programs strategies to do things and people give us feedback the president has explained that looking at the nature of the challenge that he has and four years within when to fix it he needs a government of this nature to deliver you notice that our constitution never fixed a limit and gave the prerogative to the president i recall dr endum during the campaign said he would run this country with 40 minutes that's his prerogative somebody says to do this job within this period I need 110 ministers and their deputies. That's his prerogative as well. Two things have happened. One, what will happen at the end of the four years? Would we have succeeded in transforming this country, delivering the results? And will the net effect, will the 110 ministers, as compared to the work we do at the end of four years, would it be um, just smoke that passed away? Or would it be that you appointed all of these ministers, yet you couldn't deliver? Then we'll be wrong. If we deliver beyond expectation, then we'll be justified. That's the first thing. The second thing also is that Ghanaians have given us feedback. Why are Ghanaians really worried? It's not that Ghanaians have a fixed number in their head. They are worried that this will be a big burden on the national purse. It will waste money. One ten ministers, everybody's going to get a car, what, extra salary, all of these things. It will waste money. And all of these ministers will be falling over each other. People will know their roles. So what has government done in response? I put in place to ensure that the measures, uh, that 110 ministers don't waste money. So for example, I'm a member of parliament. I'm not going to get paid as a minister of state. I would have still been paid as an MP whether or not I was a minister. So I'm doing extra work, no extra pay. Yeah, but it was something that the previous government too was doing, where mm. they were not giving them double pay. 70 out of your 110 are MPs. 
So you are not so only about forty are being paid. That's very close to what uh, you know you in the PPP mm -hmm. talked about in terms of the cost. Me in the PPP. No, I mean you mentioned earlier. <laughs> Okay, which is fine. I mean, it's okay. Don't worry. It's okay. No, no, we are no allowed best, to belong no to best. different parties <laughs> and express our views on how things should go. I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, that is one side of it. You find that a lot of them are members of parliament, are not being paid any um, extra. You find, for example, I use my private car for government business. We haven't been given vehicles. The president has said it's a moratorium. He's not going to go out there and spend. So the worries of the people about will this thing be a waste on the people? The president is responding to the worries by making sure that even though he still needs 110 people to deliver on railways, for example, on today we're talking about fishing, designating somebody to focus on fishing and delivering and not subsuming fishing and agriculture, okay? So that the problems that the lady talked about can be tackled. Those things can be done, but we still don't end up spending more money. Okay. That's what the president has done. Okay. Um, in, in my opinion, I wrote another article on the, the 110 gov uh, ministers and I said, I think I, I the, the, the president's strategy is to micromanage because you realize that in some sectors, there were there are a couple of, even the information ministry, there are how many deputies? About three deputies. About three, three deputies. So I, I, he wants to get information on every bit of maybe the economy. So, if you think that you want to use 40, somebody wants to use 110. Let's just hope that the, the our PES doesn't go up. That's all. That's and then, that, and the, all. Which, is, which is a solid point. Let's hope that our PES doesn't go up and then let's see the results at the end. Uh, of the at day. the end of the day. I know you have a lot to say. We have a lot to ask you. Um, free SHS we didn't touch on. So, make yourself available for us once again. I will again. be available. Thank you. I'll Thank you available. very much. MFR called me. We arranged. I came. I'm sure. He's um, been dreaming, sleeping. Kojo Ponkroma. I'm here. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, Kojo Ponkroma is Deputy Minister for Information, also Member of Parliament for Ofwasi Ayurebi. He's been with us um, for the past more than one hour. Thank you. We have another very important interview coming up. Ghana going satellite. People don't understand. I'm not an expert. So, we are bringing the experts into the studio to explain what it means to us going satellite. Um, is the country really going to benefit from it? And where do we go from here? Because you realize we, we spoke with the engineers of, you know, um, the achievement and they said they still need government support. What is the support they need? Is it financial? Is it creating an environment? Is it government making use of what they have actually achieved? So where do we go from here as a country? I'm sure the next time when you come, we'll have you touch on that as well. So thank you for coming. Thank you. You're watching the first show, Issues Worth Your Time. I'll be back shortly. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. So, you can now subscribe and pay for your first digital channels by using MTN Mobile Money, Airtel Money, or Visa to pay for your subscription. First, download and login.